The Holy Gospel this evening comes from St. Luke in the 17th chapter. Jesus says, or the apostles actually say to Jesus, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Over the last 34 years, it has been my great privilege to know many, many wonderful pastors and leaders in the Christian church. And, you know, coming out of our tradition as I do, and I'm steeped and raised in the Lutheran church and Lutheran theology, um, and it's part of my very blood, practically, um, that's just something that is, is who I am and what I am about. And as I go about and speak with others uh, who, great as they may be as Presbyterians or Episcopalians or non-denominational ministers or whatever the case may be, uh, and we may agree on many things when it gets to these two verses in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Lutherans tend to depart from the rest of our Protestant uh, brothers and sisters in this particular case because we have a slightly different understanding of, of what faith is. You know, the, the way in which the story is told just briefly is that the disciples go to Jesus and say, increase our faith. And Jesus says, you know, if you just had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could take this mulberry tree and put it in the ocean. And, and, and what happens is, is that for so, so many of us, we, we tend to think of faith as like, imagine it's like a liquid okay, and it's like water or something, and, 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 and we drink a little bit of it, and then we get really parched, and, and then we have to fill that water jug back up, and then we can fill that water jug back up, and then we have faith, and it gets lower, and Jesus fills the faith up, and, and, and that's, that's, how, that's how the disciples seem to be thinking about it, increase our faith, but, but that's not what faith is. In fact, it's not even close to what faith is. Faith isn't a thing at all. It's not like water. It's not like anything else. If it's like anything, it's like the love between a mother and her child. It's like the adoration between a grandson and a grandfather. If faith is a thing at all, it is at best a description of a relationship between God and humanity. What Chris's favorite teacher used to call the regal relationship between God on the cross and the human at the foot of the cross. And a lot of people struggle with that because they want faith to be a thing. They want faith to be like water so that you can go get some more, you can get some faith here, you can come to church and get some faith. But that's not how it works. And because it doesn't work that way, what happens is, is that, that a lot of us struggle with our relationship with God and we, and we rightly say that we, we don't have any faith and, and it's not exactly 100% true. Because you see, you have all the faith you need. Because faith comes from God, not from you. I'll say that again. Faith comes from God, not from you. You can increase your faith. I don't care how many times you come to communion. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care what you do. I don't care how good you are. You can't increase your faith. It's not yours. It's God's. God creates faith. Luther says, I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ except that the Holy Spirit has called, gathered, and enlightened me with his gifts just as he has called, gathered, and enlightened the entire church. None of us come to God. God comes to us. And because God comes to us, faith is a way in which we describe the relationship of God coming to us. It is not something that we need to somehow have a thing in the back of our pocket or our canteen filled with water or our gas tank filled with spiritual gas. That's not what it is. It's given to you by the grace of God in a drop of water or a sip of bread, uh, wine or a crust of bread. But it's God's, not ours. And... What happens, of course, is that then we struggle with, with faith because we think, well, we need to somehow get it, but we already have it. And what Jesus is saying, if we had the fa faith of a, even a mustard seed, a very tiny seed, if we had just even a little bit, we could, we could move this mulberry tree into the ocean. 
And if you've tried to ever move a mulberry tree in the ocean and it hasn't worked, I guess we're left with one obvious conclusion. You don't have a lot of faith. <laughs> right? I mean, let's all try it. Try to move something out of this. Let's just use our faith. Let's all, let's all, and maybe, how about this? How about we collectively do it together? Let's all collectively try to move the baptismal font out into the narthex with our faith. What do you think? We can do it in 10 seconds? Let's give it 10 seconds. Ready? Here we go. All right, somebody's not trying. <laughs> you see? If faith was something like that, yeah, boom, it would go. But that's not what it is. And so when the disciples come to Jesus and say, increase our faith, Jesus is like, oh, brothers and sisters, you have missed the point of what faith is. Faith is God entering into our lives. Now, so every now and then, you know, in the course of my life, uh, I have met famous, famous people. That's just part of what I, I don't know how it is. I just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time. But uh, two weeks ago, I probably met the most famous person I've ever met in my life. A couple weeks ago, uh, because my wife knows even more famous people than I do, uh, I was able to have dinner with William Paul Young. Now, you might have heard the name William Paul Young, and you're trying to figure out why. He wrote a book called The Shack, which became a movie. And William Paul Young was just a regular old guy, just trying to make a living. He had three jobs, and his wife asked him to write a, write a little something out for their kids for Christmas because they didn't have enough money for Christmas presents. And so he wrote this thing. His wife was expecting, as he says, about six pages. He wrote a 170-page book called The Shack. Went over to Office Depot, photocopied it off for his kids. Everything was fine. He had some friends that read the book and wanted to turn it into a movie. And he said, whatever. And when they decided they were going to do that, they said, well, first you've got to have it as a, a book on the New York Times bestseller list. And once you do that, then you can make it into a movie. And Paul was like, well, whatever you've got to do. So uh, they, made, they published some copies. And one week, there was no shack on the New York Times bestseller list. The next week, it was the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list, and it stayed there for 43 weeks, and it's been on the New York Times best, uh, 500 uh, bestseller list since 2007. It is the most printed book in the world outside of the Bible and the Quran. Over 100 million people have read this book, and I had dinner with the dude. So he's got 100 million good friends, and, uh, and you would think that somebody who is, who is that famous, uh, 67th all-time best-selling author in the history of the world, you know, 67, that's pretty good for somebody who's only, been, only written one book, <laughs> two now, I guess. But what he taught me was interesting, is that here's a guy, right, who writes this book called The Shack, and how many, has anybody out here read it? Has anybody read it? Anybody read The Shack? A few of you have, okay, yeah, excellent. So... So here's this guy that's just famous, beyond famous. And he's sitting in an airport waiting to come from Minneapolis to here. And he's on his phone like we're all on our phones these days, and he's talking to his family and friends saying, yeah, the trip's going fine so far. I'm in Minneapolis. I'm going to go to this city called Omaha. Who heard of it? Whatever. And uh, he looks up, and the person sitting across in the seat across from him is reading The Shack. Okay, yeah, airport, you read a book, people do that still. Well, a lot of people use Kindle, but this, this woman actually had an actual book. So he, he takes a picture, you know, and sends it to his, his wife and his kids and saying, hey, should I go over to her and see if she wants me to sign her book? And his kids are like, yeah, do it, Dad, do it. And his wife is like, oh, you tasteless old. So he's like, oh, he should, he's thinking about it. So, so he goes... He, he, his phone's starting to run out of power, and she, she happens to be sitting next to a, an outlet, so he goes over and he sits down next to her and plugs his phone in, and as he do, does this, he, uh, he says, what you doing? And she says, oh, I'm reading this book called, called Shack. And he goes, um, you want me to sign it? And she looks at him, and then she looks at the picture on the back of the book, and then she looks at him, <laughs> and she goes, oh, my gosh, 
is it really you? And he goes, yeah, most days. And it turns out that this woman is traveling from his part of the world up in the North uh, Oregon area, up in Oregon, Southern Washington, comes from the First Nation tribe out there. And uh, she and her uh, husband are reading this book and they're traveling together. And it's interesting is that they're, they're the actual tribe and live in the area where the actual shack is set. The whole story of the book is set in a shack out in a, in a wilderness area which is owned by First Nations of the Nez Perce. And so this woman has had a connection to this land through her ancestors forever, and he wrote a book about it, and then they're sitting in the Minneapolis airport on their way to Omaha talking about what this book has meant to this woman and her husband as they try to figure out how to live their life. And he listens patiently, and he signs the book. And then he, they head on the plane. You see, what Paul Young actually got to understand about that book that he wrote and now as he's lived his life is that faith is this, is this energy that we cannot grasp. It is this relationship that we cannot wrap our, our arms around, much less our minds. It exists beyond all understanding. It exists beyond all happenstance and coincidence, beyond all time and space. Faith is the gift that God has given to each and every one of us for the simple reason that God loves you. God loves you so much. And God loves you so much that God will do anything to make sure that you know that you're loved. So one of the things I learned, having spent a couple days with Paul Young, is, is that he is a hugger. Now, I can hug. You know, you get, you got, I got this body. It's for hugging. It's, it's, bear, it's bear hugging. You know, I got it. You know, I don't have one of those skinny bodies where you just hug and bones. I can hug. I don't, I don't make a big deal out of it, and, I, and I'll, I'll usually be polite. But if you want to hug, I'll give you a hug. If you, if you don't want to hug, I'm, I'm pretty good just going high five or hey or fist bump, whatever you're going to do. But he's a hugger. And, and here's another thing about him. He, this, is, and this, this, always, this always amazes me, is he's short. I have nothing against short people. But I am always disconcerted when famous people are short. Because they're famous. They should be big, you know? If you're famous, if you're on the New York Times bestseller list, you should be at least six foot, 5'11 at the minimum, you know? He's not. So I go to say goodbye. He hugs me. And he keeps hugging me. And he keeps hugging me. And I'm thinking to myself, he's not going to let go. <laughs> this is going to come as no shock to you, but I'm kind of competitive. So I'm like, well, I'm not letting go. And he's not letting go, and I'm not letting go. Finally, I look at him and say, brother, we could be hugging all day, but you've got a line of people 75 deep. <laughs> he goes, well, I don't let go unless the other person wants to. And I said, well, what happens if we stay embraced in this eternal bro hug for, for two hours? And he goes, so be it. When you're in the faith of God, all the things that, that run through our minds, like the propriety of how long to hug somebody or all the other things that go on, when you're in the faith of God, all that stuff gets, gets placed in proper perspective. And you see that the mulberry tree is already in the ocean because it never left, because we're all together in the love of God. And when we talk about faith then, Try not to get caught up in thinking about faith as some kind of liquid or some kind of substance that you have to get more of. It's like a steroid when your knee hurts and you get a steroid and you feel better. No, that's not what faith is about. Faith is about God coming into your life. And when you start to feel weak, when you start to feel injured, when you start to feel like the world is put upon you, when you start to feel stress, when you start to feel despair, to understand that you have all the faith you need. God is finding a way to work in you. God is finding a way to say, I love you. And that's faith. That's what faith is. Faith is God constantly working to find ways that we are loved. And all of our machinations to try to create faith, to put faith into something that we can control, 
misses the point of why Jesus died on a cross. He didn't die on a cross so that we can control the love of God. He died on a cross so that the love of God could be given to us in our own mortality and in our own ways of living. And none of us, none of us are probably going to ever be as famous as Paul Young. I doubt I'll ever sit in an airport and look across and have somebody read the ecclesiology of God, the social doctrine of the Trinity between the divine and the human, which is the title of my book. But, but, every airport I'm in, I can be assured that God loves me. Not because of what I do, but because of what God does. And in Jesus Christ, because of what God did. He died and he rose so that we can live in faith.